Great. All right, before, before I open in a word of prayer, I just want to read the word of God. Just a word of encouragement as things are, things are really difficult right now. And from the looks of things, everyone is, I don't want to say struggling, but we're def definitely wrestling. We're wrestling with what's going on in the world. And so I want to read from uh, Psalm 115, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 115, verses 1 to 3. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should this nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And so we've been studying biblical theology. We've been looking at the balance between <laughs> election and free choice. The, we've been emphasizing the sovereignty of God. And so here, I think this is a very challenging to us. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. So I just really want this to be something that we meditate upon tonight. We are, God is in complete control. He is allowing this to happen. He isn't, he could just end this tomorrow. He could end this right now if he wanted to, but he has a greater purpose. And so sometimes we can't see it. And our job is not to do not fret. That's an old English word. Don't fret. Don't, don't worry. He is in the throne and he will guide and strengthen us. Just before we pray, am I loud and I'm clear? Everyone can hear me. My voice is loud and clear. Okay, great. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your love, your guidance in our lives. I pray for your strength as we do your will, that you'd lead us, you'd guide us, that you'd strengthen us, and that we would serve you faithfully. It's in your, your, uh, your son's precious name we pray all these things. Strengthen uh, the heart of your people. May our, may our hearts be... Uh, focused on you and steadfast, Father God. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin our study. I am just so excited. We have a lot to, to get into tonight. I do want to say right off the bat that some of us are going through difficulties, as was mentioned. Uh, uh, we'll have a special prayer time at the end of our class. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's get into the, the PowerPoint. We are doing breakout rooms shortly, but I just want to give a, a quick overview for, for the session tonight. This is going to be good. I'm excited. This is a good class. I am just, I'm in love. I'm in love with biblical theology. I hope that you have fallen in love too. You know, it's, I, I am learning so much and uh, I'm just, this is, this is probably one of my favorite classes in the past five years of teaching. This is probably my favorite class. So I'm just, I'm in love right now. I'm, 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 I'm in love. So uh, our partners, we, we just really want to thank EVST, that, uh, Cebu Graduate School of Theology, and also Converge for making this happen. Session number 10. So we're session number 10. I can't believe that we're this far. The mode, uh, we're breaking the chapter into two parts. The mode of special revelation during the Mosaic period is tonight, and then next week will be the content. So tonight is the mode, and, and next, or, or the, the mode or the form. Mode or form is the same word synonymous. And then next week, we'll be looking at the content. So we will get through chapter eight. So tonight, you should have finished your reading for um, the reading reflection. There is no scripture reading reflection report, because those of you that are enrolled in the MAT program, whether CGST, EVST, you have the midterm to work on. So that will be due later this week. I believe it's the 25th. So for those of you who have, who are, who you sh it's, it's posted on the, the, the Facebook group. So if you have a question after class, we can discuss it, but the midterm, it's self-explanatory. It should not be uh, stressful. You can sit down, you can take as much time as you want to work through it. I do want one sitting. So I don't want you working a little bit each day. I want you to, to find a block of time to sit down and work through it. And, uh, and, and it's self-explanatory, okay? So you can use your notes, you can use your Bible, you can use the PowerPoints, you can use the book. You can't use your classmate. You can't use another teacher. You can't use the internet. Okay, so that <laughs> that is strict, not strict. Okay, so 
and there'll be a pledge that you need to sign that your word is your bond, that before God, before God and man, you have, you have acted in the integrity of your heart. Okay, so next, overview of this session for tonight, okay? So uh, we're gonna have the breakout session first. So once, once we're done with this overview, I will go ahead and um, split you out into groups to discuss the reading. Um, and I'll give some specific guidance. I'll, I'll give some specific guidance to, to kind of help us from last week. And actually after this week, in the future, the future, um, the, ne the, the next assignments, I will give specific areas of focus and questions that you will have to really interact with. So uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna level up again in our reading and I'm gonna give you specific areas to, to answer questions and also to interact with. So the, the reading re reflection report is going to take just one notch up. It's gonna take one notch up now that we're consistently uh, t t turning them in. Okay, then we'll discuss the reading. The next thing was we'll discuss the reading. We'll discuss the, the, what, you, what you discussed in your groups. Then we are going to look at three, or, or sorry, um, two parts of chapter number eight. Number one, we're looking at the prominence of Moses with regard to special revelation. So we'll be looking at the prominence of Moses. Moses is prominent. He's very prominent in revelation. So, so we'll be looking at that. We will also look at the, the form of revelation during the Mosaic period. So there's several different forms, uh, or we could say mode, the way by which God is revealing himself. And then next week, we're going to go into more of the content, okay? And you have to remember that there is so much information in the Old Testament. We, in many ways, are just doing like a broad stroke. We're trying to get core fundamental components. So we're going to be kind of a little bit all over the place. But that's just because there's so much information, number one. Number two, we can't think of looking at it chronologically. Uh, I shouldn't say chronologically. We are looking at it chronologically. I should say that um, in order of the books of, of the Bible. We can't look at it like that because there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of repetition. So Voss actually says in his discussion, and maybe this will be helpful as you read, that he's doing it topically. So he's looking at various topics of both the form and the content, and then he's just highlighting things because there's many that there's a lot of repetitive themes. So just going through a strict order of the books will not be helpful. It'll be, it'll still be confusing. And, um, and we're, we are doing very rough chronology, but not really specific. I don't know if that's making sense, but tonight we'll be looking at both the prominence of Moses and also the form of revelation. So we'll also be unpacking a lot of scripture, scripture passages and, and going um, going deep into that. We will have, if we have time, we will have a closing breakout room just for you to further reflect, and then we'll have a closing prayer. Okay, so now we're on to breakout rooms. I'm going to go ahead and pause this, uh, this session. And so um, let me go ahead and create the breakout rooms for us to get into. So how many do we have? We have nine. So I'm going to, I'm just going to do, let's do three breakout rooms. Okay, we're going to do three breakout rooms. And as you're looking at the breakout rooms, I want you as a group, whereas before in the past, I've had you go around and share, you can still go around and share, but I want, I want one, uh, one major significance or two major significances, the things you liked, one or two major significances of things you dislike. There wasn't a lot I disliked about. So maybe it's more, po maybe, maybe it's more just positive. So two things that you liked. If you have something you dislike, please share it. And then at least one question. So that's a little bit different. So you can, you can work around the room, but your goal is what is the most significant thing that spoke to you? What one or two things? And then if there was something you disagreed with, let, let's discuss that, okay? Um, so at this point, okay, everyone, just make sure uh, you're, you're muted so there's no feedback and we will get into the discussion. So several people came in late. Um, we'll, do, we'll do those questions and answers from each of the breakout group teams. And then those two students that came in late, if you want to share, you can add. So because you just missed it. Okay. So what I want to write here first is um, this here is going to be observations And these are plus, it's a, it's a good, it's a good observation. Then we'll do if you have observations negative 
and then we can do, we'll do an orange for your questions. Okay, so group number one, breakout room number one, I believe that was Shoni, Danny, Henry, and Joe Mar. Maybe some came in late. What are your what are your observations from your reading? Okay, observation. Okay, in but we did uh, but we did not discuss this. You know. in observation, Wellhausen. Wellhausen. In he is not a believer of. <laughs> He's not a believer of Moses. Yeah. He's a naturalist person. Yeah. So Moses, Moses is not, yeah, Moses is not real. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> okay, good. But but something I want something positive. I want something positive, a good observation concerning uh, okay. the form or the that's a great observation. And even though he did not say it, it was clear. So that was good, but I want something positive, something that you learned that was profound. Okay, uh, Moses, the 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 prominence of Moses extend so extend so great that even the later prophet they just take it from Moses. There is nothing new, or that is new. It says here in page 18, 118. Moses' authority extends over subsequent ages. The later prophets did not create anything new. They only predict something new. They just copy from what Moses had. So Moses was really a great person. Great. That's an excellent observation. And that really shows us so that's a great observation. So let's make a connection here. Okay, so we first saw the importance for the historicity and the content of revelation in Genesis, especially in the garden, Diba, and also with Noah and the, 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 the line of Seth and also the line of, of, of Cain and the, what was revealed in the nature of man. Then we also saw the last two weeks how important the historicity is of the patriarchs and how and how the in the lives of the patriarchs god god creates he solidifies objective real religion okay now we're seeing how important moses is okay and henry henry's comment is even more important because people reject all of this so mm -hmm. so they're rejecting all of this okay so when people talk about, oh, you know, we disagree on this or that, or Old Testament, uh, the, the, the source, the sources, uh, the, the formation of the Old Testament, but, but we can still have the same faith. No, it's, it's a complete, like they're, they're throwing out the entire foundation. They're rejecting the entire foundation by which our religion has been founded upon, on, on, on which our relationship with God. When I say religion, I'm referring to our relationship with God, okay? I'm using Voss's terminology. It's a very positive terminology. It's not religion in a negative sense, okay? Great. All right. Uh, group number two, what was the big idea, something that you liked? So we can discuss later if there's a, a, a criticism right now. I want to focus on things that you like. What was a, a big observation of something that you like? Just, just one leader or one person from group number two. Is that our group? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Go, go. Oh, Kea, okay. Kea, yeah, Kea Boboy, Jesus, okay. and Christian. Yeah. yeah. I I will have to obey Kia because she told me to discuss with you. Okay. Okay. Our first discussion was on that aspect of the significance of Moses, uh, the prominence, as we as we as uh, we call it, but. Uh, Mr. Boss called it the significance of Moses. There were two that were mentioned. Number one, he led Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And number two, that he was placed ahead of the, of the other prophets. So that is very significant because of the so many prophets as we get. There are so many prophets 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, but they were not called to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So it was given to Moses. So that is the most significant role of Mo uh, Moses in this uh, history, uh, in, the, in this era. Uh, being, being the leader of Israelite in going to the promised land, Kea used the word, he, he was sort of a redeemer in the Old Testament uh, period. Yeah. Okay? That's Kea's word. Okay, and the forms, uh, Pastor Jesus was asking about the pillar of the cloud. What is the significance of the pillar of the cloud? So he said, uh, the only explanation there that is, is, is the presence of God. So whenever there's a cloud, there is the presence of God. And uh, Kea asked, what if there are so, what we see on the clouds every day. So that means the God is there. And if, and then if that cloud will uh, follow you all day long, that means God is following you also all day long. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that was how we, 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 we discussed the pillar of the cloud. It, it, uh, it means the presence, the presence of God. Uh, with respect to the angel of Jehovah and the name of Jehovah, although we mentioned it, but we did not discuss much of it, except that the I am started with Moses. God revealed to Moses the I am. It was to Moses that God revealed I am. Now, it's important. It's, in, it's important, okay? I think Voss says this because before Exodus 3, the Lord's name is also used. It's in Genesis. It's in, it's in Genesis 1. So I believe what Voss, and we can correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we'll also talk about this next week. I just want to say it now in case we don't discuss it. Uh, is that the name is used, but no one really understands the full significance. I think that's what Voss is saying. So it's not, so it's, it's not that, because the liberals will say, okay, this is a, this, it's a different God. It's a different God than El, than Elohim. And so now, you know, this is where it's created. But, but what Voss is saying, and I agree with that, because in the text, we have it in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The, the, the Lord's name is there. And, and what, um, uh, what, what Voss is bringing out, and I agree with him, is that th there is a uniqueness in explaining to Moses who the I am is. But it's not to say that they did not know of the of the name prior to, okay. So it's a revealing. It's not a creating of a of a name. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? I hope everyone's tracking there with me. Okay. There is there is a further explanation by both in the later pages. I think it's in between one pages one thirty two to one thirty three. He went back to the I am I am thing. Uh, yeah. What is the correct? Uh, translation to English. Yeah, of that it's word. debated. It's the debated. Hebrew. Yeah, it's yeah, so debated. There's a debate. Yeah, yeah there's a debate. He, he mentioned there's a debate. Yeah, it, 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 to be honest with you, there's a huge debate, and and I'm more inclined to see multiple, I multiple ideas. It, it's just so comprehensive. So we we'll talk about that probably next week. We will discuss that next week. Okay, great. Okay, group number, group number four. Group number four. Group number three. Sorry, this is uh, our discussion with uh, scholar Sunny is <laughs> in uh, actually the same page with what uh, Pastor Henry shared. I would just uh, like to read. Uh, prospectively uh, considered, Moses also occupies a dominant place in religious development of the OT. Uh, he's not. He is placed not merely at the head of the succession of the prophet, but placed over them in advance. He, his authority extends over the subsequent age. Uh, for me, uh, it, it's a great, uh, actually, it's a great uh, learning. Uh, it's one big idea I, I, what I want to share because uh, in Deuteronomy, in the, the last, the last uh, chapter of Deuteronomy, there's uh, a passage that says, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So just like what Jesus, I think, uh, shared uh, kanina, uh, a while ago that he he is really a great prophet. And when there is there will be people when there will be prophet, I think in there, there will be prophet uh, will ar arise in after Moses. The people of Israel will always uh, 
ask question if if this is the one is if this is the one who who will arise uh, that is greater than Moses uh, is is this the one who is to become greater than Moses and I think Pastor Sani has also a lot to share also with this one Pastor Sani oh yes um um just just little um I just want to put that in the context of what was term the Berith, you know the, the the covenant with with the covenant of of Yahweh to Israel in in, in Exodus chapter 19. And it is, it's, it's more amazing that uh, the, the prophet, the prophet always look back to Moses, you know, try to execute the, the Mosaic law at the same time, the, the prophet, like Moses, uh, it seems that, it seems that Moses is the prefiguration of, 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 of the Israel's, you know, Israel's um, Messiah or Savior. And it is amazing that we, if we look at, if you look at in the perspectively, perspectively, that, that means in the New Testament, how the New Testament used this account in, in, in Exodus or, or in a mosaic figure, we could, we could say the same as questions of, of those Israelites. Are we expecting someone? Are we expecting like Moses? And of course, John also in, 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 in Matthew chapter 11 also asked the same question to, uh, Told his disciple to ask Jesus if, if there is, are we, are, he is the one, if, if Jesus is the one, the, the Messiah, or, or they expecting another, and then Jesus uh, answered it straightly that uh, told this, told John that uh, what you have seen and heard, that blind sees and then lame walk, and all those miracles, and um, yeah, uh, that's that's we we what we observe also in the the better covenant. If you would like to uh, to culminate these ideas from from boss in mosaic figure or prefigure of Moses. So, so what are the ways that boss describes either Sonny can answer this or anyone. What are the ways that Moses prefigures the Messiah? So boss will be explicit. What are the ways anyone from your reading? What are the ways? Priest, priest and king. Yes. Priest, king, and prophet, prophets. Prophet, prophet, priest, and king. Excellent. Prophet, priest. We, we, we wouldn't, we would, we'd want to say royal because God royal. is king at this point, or we could say leader. And, and, and there is for sure, this is a kingly function, but, but we don't want to say he explicitly, he is king because the, the one who is king at this point is the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, okay? But no other prophet, no other prophet was like this, Diba. So this is also why just looking at uh, Moses's role and function, of course, he is giving, he, he has given the, the law. He is the one by which God gives the law, right? He is the means. Uh, and the prophets, so j let's just look at a big picture here. So just to be clear here, um, the, the Lord, I, I'm, I'm doing it here because, because maybe we don't have time later. The Lord, uh, through Moses, gives the law, okay? Later in, so if we're looking here, this is, this is time, okay? This is time, all right? Later... The prophets, these here are prophets later, but they're not giving new law. What they're, what they're doing here is they are, if you can imagine, uh, uh, let's just do, um, this is Israel, okay? They're coming on the scene they're looking at Israel and they're calling them back to the Lord. Okay. So, so they are, they are assessing, they are assessing Israel's behavior in relationship to the law. And so most, the two key words that continue come up is they are proclaiming judgment 
and salvation, depending upon the context. So is everyone tracking there with me? So this here, this is the foundation, okay? And then the prophets, subsequent prophets, they're looking at Israel's behavior and they're saying, thus says the Lord, you are either obeying the law or you're disobeying it. You need to repent. And if you don't repent, there will be judgment. Uh, if you do repent, there can be, uh, 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 you will not be judged. You will have blessing. And then at a certain time, there's judgment. But then again, there will be salvation after the judgment. Okay? So I hope everyone's understanding the relationship here. So Moses, Moses is really at, at a fundamental place. And, and all of this, big picture here, okay? All of this is a this is a shadow this is a shadow of going back to our big picture new covenant and Christ this is eternal we could also talk about eternal Okay, so I hope everyone's kind of seeing that big picture here. Okay, so this is also, you could say, looking back, it's a shadow. Looking this way, it's a shadow. Looking this way, it's a type. Okay, everyone's tracking there with me. Every, everyone, everyone's, everyone's there. Okay, all right. So, th so your observations are, are so great. I, I'm really happy that we, we picked up on this. And so, um, were there any negative criticisms or any questions that you had? We don't have a lot of time. I'll, 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 give, I'll give you 30 seconds if someone wants to ask a question or someone wants to make a, a, a criticism about Voss. Moses was the, okay, God, God gave the law or the Decalogue to Moses for the Israelite people. Yeah. And Jesus, in Jesus' time, he fulfilled that Decalogue or that law. Yeah, so so th that's yeah yeah so 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 that's where it's coming into the present. Oops. Yeah, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Yeah. Whereas Moses so, is the uh, he sets the law or how we call that? Mediates. He mediates the law. He mediates. One question also, sir Tim, um, regarding to that law, law fulfillment in new in the new covenant, yep. in I mean in, in in Jesus Christ is that. Are we still under those three type, type or type of, of the law, like moral law, um, ritual law, and the civil law? Which which one is, uh, I would say, being obsolete, and then which one is is you know still still functions for us? Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. so that that's that's kind of going beyond the scope of the, for the, for for this class. That's going beyond the scope of this class. But I will say this: that some of those. The the the, serum, the the sacrificial was fulfilled in Christ. So we're no longer, there's one sacrifice, one for all. So it's fulfilled. It's done away with, right? The, the moral law, uh, Paul will say in multiple places, the most notably Romans 14, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The one who's doing that fulfills the whole law. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not covet. And so in Paul's understanding, that law is still in effect. It's still in effect because we're fulfilling the law in our obedience. So fulfilling the law in the, the moral sense is us still practicing the law. And so this really gets to why there's a there's a there's a major issue with other forms of of perspectives on the law because they want to say, no, the Old Testament law is comprehensive, done away with. But that's not how the New Testament understands it. Um, uh, Paul will just quote. Uh, the first, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the first covenant. Uh, this is the first commandment with a promise. <laughs> He's quoting the Old Testament law. He's commanding the children to still obey their parents without explanation, without talking about fulfilling in Christ. It's just, it's still binding. The, the Old Testament law is still binding. And so you, we do have to be very cautious how we navigate. Some things are fulfilled. Some things are done away with. Some things are transformed. 
but we would not want to say that it's done away with. Abrogated, it's it's not ended. It's there there because remember it's a shadow and it's a type, right? So so these things are 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 part of the real image, but not the substance. Okay, so you're gonna see you're gonna see many things that are the same and many things that are different, many things that are are even more crazy. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say. We maybe one day we'll have a, a class we just on the law. We we can literally just have a class just on the law. Actually, what time is it? Okay, we're gonna start the PowerPoint and then we're gonna take a break in in ten minutes. Okay, so just remind me. If I do not give you the break in 10 minutes, I want to give you the break, okay? So let's let's begin the PowerPoint. So we're now on to notes and scripture analysis of special revelation concerning the special revelation during the Mosaic era. History of revelation. So we're on point number three, history of revelation. And the mode and content. So we're still we're still unpacking this mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament. We're on to number six now. Number six, the, the mode and content, the form and content of special revelation during the Mosaic era. So we're looking at during the Mosaic era, and we're looking specifically at, for tonight, the prominence of Moses and also the mode of revelation during the Mosaic era. So there's two things we're looking at. Number one, the, the prominence of, of Moses and also the, the mode of revelation which is slightly different. So God is speaking directly to, to Moses, but at the same time, he's revealing himself. And in some instances, it's more than just to Moses, right? So this is very significant here. Um, next week, we will focus on the content. So next week, we'll get the second half of chapter eight, and that's the content of Revelation during the Mosaic period. Okay, first, looking at the prominence of Moses in the organism of OT Revelation. So the prominence of Moses in the organism of OT revelation. Voss says, we must show that from very early times, Moses did occupy a, a most prominent place in the religious conscience of Israel. So of course, Voss is dealing with liberal theology, but they, they were saying that everything was late and that Moses, uh, Moses, maybe he was real, maybe he wasn't real, but, but everything's been out of whack. It's not what, what he did is all been exaggerated. It's been embellished. We can't really know who Moses was, except that he was this leader of these some tribes that that were like in the wilderness. <laughs> That's what they say. So, so what what Voss is trying to get at is that we go, we're going to look, we're going to prove that Moses was always prominent in the religious conscience of Israel. And so, how is he going to do that? He also wants to say that. Moses stands out as the great religious leader of his people. So it's not just a military leader. It's not just political leader. It's, it's this religious leader that has set up this ethic that hasn't changed. And again, depending on how you interpret the Old Testament law, it's still the same in the New Testament, right? So the core truth of Old Testament ethic is the same in the New Testament. What is the core ethical commands that are the same in the New Testament as the Old Testament. If we're going to get down to the, to, to, or we're going to summarize the Old Testament law in its biggest form, maybe this gets back to some part of Sonny's question. How can we summarize the, the uh, in, in its entirety, the Old Testament ethic and how that relates to the New Testament? How would you summarize it? How would you summarize it? Yes, is it the greatest, two greatest commandments? to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes. Kaya is correct. So I, I heard several people say it, um, but Kaya said it most eloquently. So we will, we will defer to the more lovely one of the group. <laughs> uh, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So people try to say there's a different ethic or the ethic is inferior. That's not true. Is that ethic still binding in the New Testament? Absolutely. So this, again, this comes back to if that ethic is, is the core foundation of the Mosaic law, okay, and it's been given by Moses, and that's through into the present, you have a very strong case 
that number one, Moses is, is the, the leader and he's the one that gave it. Okay. So this also goes into questions that like Sonny had concerning is the most law still in effect? Is it, is it done away with? And so at that very core foundation, it's still in effect. It has not been abrogated. It never will be abrogated. Without dispute in the oldest writings, the prophets, Amos, Hosea, a supreme place is given to Moses. So this is what this is this is the track. This is the path of of Voss. There's there's later prophets, there's earlier prophets. Voss is saying, what is the place of prominence of Moses in those oldest prophets? If he is viewed as the leader uh, religiously, ethically, then there's a very strong case for us to assume that he was actually there um, and involved in the in revealing it to the to the to the people. Everyone tracking there with me? So if you look at the earliest prophets, and Moses is there as a leader and as a re- religious leader, then that's a very strong case. That in fact, they're not changing, they're not embellishing. That's going to continue back to the time of, of, of Moses. And there's no real liberal that would dispute this. These are the oldest writings, Amos, Hosea, there's some others. But, but, but a supreme place is given to Moses in these. And we're going to look at just several, just several right now. Um, Hosea 12, 13. By a prophet... Jehovah brought, sorry for the typo, by a prophet, Jehovah brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. So preserved is, is that he is going back to Israel. It's a corporate, a corporate pronoun, a corporate noun. But the earliest, the earliest, this is an apologetic argument, okay? Voss is making an apologetic argument. The earliest prophets place Moses, Moses isn't just some other prophet. He's right there. He's the granddaddy right there at the beginning. Amos 3.1. And I'll also do Amos 3.1 and 3.2. The whole family which I brought out of the land of Egypt, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. So notice here, there's a, there's a, there's a prominence for sin and disobedience. Okay, that's early. It's an early, it's an early tech, it's an early prophet. And they're coming out. They're coming out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> so again, so again, it's it's very early. It's it, and and it's this proof uh, that in fact Moses is involved here. Okay, let's let's go in our let's go in the, our scripture to Isaiah. I want to look at Isaiah sixty three. In their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved him. So we'll discuss this a little bit later. That's a reference to. The presence of God, right? The presence of the Lord in His angel. So this is actually this is actually just for your, for. I would write this down. This is concerning the angel of the Lord, and we discussed this last week. This this special being that represented the presence of a God that's higher than just any any normal being. There's more significance there, but it's not. It's it's signifying the presence of God, but it is not. God himself. Okay. So we have the language of he redeemed them. Ah, he redeemed them and carried them away. Okay. So this is, this is the language of, of Exodus and salvation. Right. (laughs) They rebelled. They grieved his Holy Spirit. <laughs> have we heard this reference to grieving the Holy Spirit? Where have you heard of that before? Where? Someone give me a New Testament reference. Ephesians. Hey, you, yeah, Ephesians. Ephesians, right? People want to say that the Holy Spirit's not in the Old Testament, or it's very rare. They're doing this on their own. It's a works-based salvation. This, that's interesting. Describing the Holy Spirit being grieved in the Old Testament about Israel. <laughs> Remember the days of old of Moses and his people. So this is where this is where Moses involves is emphasizing. Remember the days of old Moses' people. He brought them out of the sea, the shepherds of the flock, 
where he is put in the midst of them, his Holy Spirit. <laughs> Goodness. It calls, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how is it different from the way you say it? Uh, he grieved the Holy Spirit and grieved his Holy Spirit. Because I think Ephesians would put it, grieve the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so the his is a reference to the to the Lord. So, so you could sometimes he'll say his son or it's Jesus is God, right? So sometimes it's the son, sometimes it's the son of God, sometimes it's his only son, right? So, so sometimes Jesus is referred to as God's only son, his only son. So here, whether it's the Holy Spirit or his Holy Spirit, it's a reference to the, the third person of the Trinity. Is that, are you tracking with that? Uh, Actually, sir, uh, the, the yeah. statement in Ephesians is, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah, so it's almost, it's the same. It's the same, God's Holy Spirit. So the statement here is, the, you said in Ephesians, the Holy Spirit of God, right? So we can rewrite this, God's Holy Spirit. It's in English, it's the same. Here, it's his Holy Spirit. This, this is the same. Functionally, there's no different, right? Everyone tracking there with me? Who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths like a horse in the desert. They, they did not stumble like livestock that go down into the valley. The Spirit of the Lord, again, the Spirit of the Lord, gave them rest, so you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name, okay? But what I want us to emphasize here is this idea that Moses, this, Moses, Moses has a, a place of prominence, And it's in the context of, it's in the context of salvation, and this is dealing with ethics. Okay, everyone's tracking there with me. This is dealing with, with, with it, this is not simply just. There's a there's this ethical dimension there. Any questions or comments? Or everyone's everyone's tracking with, with me. Okay, let's go on here. Uh, uh, oh, when ahead, you yeah. mention ethics, you are referring to the law. Yeah, I'm referring to I'm referring to uh, morality. Yeah. yeah. You can say law. We can say righteousness. Sin, because they don't want it. The liberals don't want to say that they had this this high view of law righteousness. That's all post exilic. That's all late. That's all late. The only thing that was historical was just Moses leading some tribe around the wilderness. That was it. That's it. And Moses is just some leader. They don't know anything. They created, they, then from this, this origin, they created all of this other stuff. And so what we're saying here is the earliest example of the prophetic language, they're describing it as fully mature. Because what they're claiming is it's like evolution. They're slowly building these traditions and these stories, Okay. But so from very early on, what Voss is arguing for, and this is so this is apologetic argument, is that no, very early on, everything is there in fundamental form. And that's what we proved already with the patriarchs, right? We proved that it's there. So 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 in many, and sometimes maybe all of us would say, Amen, we agree with this. But this is this is something that maybe in a couple of years you will have to deal with. I know that some people are already questioning it. I, I had to deal with this in, in Manila, I'm sure in probably Cebu. It's already there. It's all over America. It's in, it's in the common books. You can buy on the, the common practical books. Like you can buy Joel Olstein. You can buy books that attack this <laughs> side by side. <laughs> pick, pick your heresy. Pick your heresy. Come on. So we're going to just finish quickly with um, this. So uh, in relationship to the type of Abrahamic promises. So this is big idea here. Okay. We're looking now at Moses. 
the true inward significance of Moses when we place him alongside the unfolding scheme of revelation can be made clear in several directions. So we can look back at his relationship with the patriarchs and we can look forward at his relationship with the prophets and ultimately Christ. Okay, that's where we're going, okay? So, so he's in some ways it's transitionary, uh, transitional or you could say he's building. He's building upon the patriarchs. So in building upon the patriarchs, so if you, let me, I'm gonna try to use this here. So uh, in one sense, you could say, This is the, the patriarchs, right? Moses is here. And it's on the way to, oops, come on, sorry. Christ, right? So we can look forward to Christ, or we can look back to the patriarchs. Okay, so that's what that's what's going on here. Okay, so then, um, for one thing, he is retrospectively retrospectively considered instrumental in bringing the great patriarch promises into incipient fulfillment, at least in their external provisional embodiment. So he doesn't bring a full fulfillment. It's a partial fulfillment, okay? And you're going to see that language in Exodus. You're going to see that language in Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus. You're going to see that especially in Joshua, okay? But then in the later prophets, we realize that, no, those promises to the patriarchs aren't really fulfilled. And then we go to the New Testament, and we find out, no, they're actually fulfilled in Christ and in the eternal state, okay? So, so um, Moses is so fundamental because he's, bringing into reality uh, the redemption that God has promised, but it's not, it's not um, eternal redemption. It's not eschatological. It's still this external provisional embodiment, but later it will still point to, towards that reality. Okay. Okay. Prospectively, considered Moses still also occupies a dominant place in the religious de development of the Old Testament. He is placed not merely at the head of the succession of prophets, but placed over them in advance. His, uh, his authority extends over subsequent ages. The later prophets do not create anything new. This is what Henry was saying. They only predict something new. And that's really true. That's really true. The, the prophets are only assessing and looking at the people and comparing it to what Moses established. And of, and of course, it's God, we want to say God establishing through Moses, okay? Um, Moses is, is the prophet of God. So it's really God's establishment and Moses is just the means. So we want to say God established the law through Moses, okay? We want to use that type of language. Okay, it's 730. Let's go ahead and let's take a 10 minute break. Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe that's, that was the short 30 seconds, but let's go ahead and begin. We have a lot to get through here. So I, I hope we're seeing how important this era is going to be for revelation, okay? We, I hope that we can see how important it is. And at the same time, this cannot be uh, ultimate. What we see here, can, it's still part of the promise. It's still part of the type. It's still part of the shadow. It can't be ultimate, okay? So I hope that we can see that, that, um, that relationship there. Okay, uh, let's look now. What I want us to do is these two passages, if I, I, I really highly suggest in your Bibles as pastors, as leaders, these two passages are so fundamental to understanding the relationship of Moses and Christ. And we also have to think about uh, so this is also where Voss is, is getting at, that no other prophet is really equated with Christ. <laughs> so, so, so we have a lot of comparisons in, in scripture between Adam and Christ. And then we also have Moses and Christ. So Adam is more negative. Adam and Christ is negative, negative, positive. Moses and Christ is good, better. <laughs> Good, better. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and let's 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 look at 
Let me stop my share here. Everyone can see that, correct? Let me go ahead and stop the share. And let's go turn your Bibles to, if you have your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and following. So I'm just going to read this. And this passage is so fundamental. This makes a this passage will make a whole lot of sense as to why the Pharisees were demanding a sign from Jesus. So if, if you are not familiar with this passage, this uh, look at the relationships of Christ to the Old Testament law, the New Testament to the Old Testament. The Lord God, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So of course this is Moses, from among you, from your brothers, it is him you shall listen to. Just as you desire to the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord or see this great fire. So we're not going to really unpack this here. We'll look at it elsewhere. But this is a reference to the revelation of God. Look at this. See, and what are they seeing? This great fire. So even here, what we should be looking at, this is a, this is a, um, a physical event Does everyone see that? This is a physical event revealing God. So we wouldn't think about this, but fire is a physical revelation of God and his character. Think about that for a minute. Have you ever thought about that? Fire is a, what specifically of God's character or attribute does fire reveal? Anyone, anyone want to take a crack at that? Glory. Glory. Glory of God. Um, so I get it. Could be, it okay, yeah. So it's a consuming fire. So so is a consuming fire though, is that is that positive or is that more negative? Negative. It's more negative. So 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 yeah, so it's focused on punishment. So what 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 concept what being the attribute? Judge. Okay, being the judge, yes. So what specific attribute though? God's is just. Your holiness. Yes, but God's wrath, Diba. The wrath, the fire comes out and consumes those that are, that are disobeying, right? So so this happens multiple times throughout scripture. God rains fire, brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so I, I don't want to say I have to think about Sonny saying glory of God. I, I don't know if that's the case. I have to think about that um, because that could be light. So let me think about that, Sonny, because actually I didn't think about the glory of God. But in this context, it's the in this context, it's it's fear. It's yes, fear. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I, I actually connected to the in you know the fire in Mount Sinai, fire and and clouds was there, and then it describes as the glory of God. But anyway, that's yeah, yeah, that's no, so I, so that that's what I'm saying. I don't. I, that's what I'm saying, Sonny. Let me think about that because I hadn't connected it before, but it could be. I, I don't want to misspeak. Most of the time, it's it's negative. So let me think about that. And if you if you find an example where the fire is directly connected with the glory. Now the fire, the fire at night would be his glory. I don't know. Let, let me let's think about that. Okay, maybe there's maybe the think, yeah. I was also so, reading that from the yeah. funny. <laughs> Coming from this text, I will clearly see that it's referring to fear because it says, there, "Let me not hear again yeah. the voice of the Lord." It's like yeah. he's fearful of the voice of God, and so it is with this manifestation of fire. Yeah, yeah. So let's. Yeah, so yeah, no, that's really good. That's a really good observation. So really, I think here in this context, so let's be clear, in this context, 
this is more the focus here. But let's also think about glory because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to discredit that because it could be as well. Okay, so let's let's just let's table that. I think if you were saying it's in theophany and also um, with with it's in the the cloud of fire and that's also his presence. So it could be glory too. So let's let's not let's tentatively agree that that's po that could be possible. But here the focus is on this. Okay, for sure here the focus because. They don't even want to, they don't, they're afraid. They're, they're terrified of God, okay? And this is the connection here, lest I die. So this, this, is, this is incredible fear here. Fear of death. The Lord said to me, they are right for what they have spoken. I will raise up for them like you, a prophet from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. So this, think about this. Jesus is, the living word. So if, if we're, we're looking here, there is, there is just to be clear, you have the, the prophet Moses. And then there's someone coming who's going to be greater than Moses. So this is why Voss is saying Moses is in this incredible place of prominence, unparalleled to any other prophet, only to be superseded by this greater prophet, okay? But think about how offensive it is when Jesus comes on the scene and the Pharisees reject and they choose Moses. How offensive is that? How disrespectful is that? That's insane. That, that, is, that is the ultimate example of unbelief and disrespect. He shall, he shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded... That same, or speak in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know that the word of the, that the Lord has not spoken when the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The, the prophet has spoken presumptuously. You do not need to be afraid of him. So this, this gets to where, just a side note, this is like, this is a, a cream cheese. This is like extra. This is extra icing for you, okay? This is why the Pharisees demanded the sign. If he didn't give the sign, they, that, that's why Jesus says, you're an evil and adulterous. You're an unbelieving, adulterous generation. Only an e evil, unbelieving, adulterous generation demands a sign because, because they, they, don't, they don't want to listen to him. They don't want to listen to, the, to Jesus' teachings. So they're demanding the sign. They're trying, to, they're trying to kick him out, okay? Now, uh, coming back here. Well, any questions first before I, I want to say one other thing. Any, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? I think Anyone that goes with our, our world right now, Tim, because most people will believe in man for a sign. And we are adults <laughs> We can generation to. That's, a, that's very profound, Ray. That's very profound. That, that that's very profound. Excellent, excellent point. Now I want to conclude with this. Okay, I want to conclude with this because there's there's all this debate, and, and I want us to see it here. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a picture to help us imagine this. Okay, so imagine this is a picture here. This is Israel. This is a picture of Israel in, in, in a, let's just say Moses' time, and there's Moses, okay? So Moses gave them the will. Let's just say here, let's just change this to word of God, right? Everyone's tracking there with me? So Moses came out from Israel, Diba. Now watch, the, the promise here is that from Israel, from among the brothers, 
There's another prophet. Greater. That will also give the word of God. Okay. So this is this is a side. This is a side. So again, maybe this is coming back to Sonny's question before in the relationship. Okay. So this other prophet is coming from is coming from Israel, just like Moses. He is going to to fill up. We could say fill up the word, and that's still being given to Israel. Okay. So. I hope what we can see here is that whatever else happens, there's only one plan. But this is this is going to be, uh, this is being completed. This is being completed, and this is ultimately going to be in Christ. Is everyone tracking there? So this is yet another, this is, this is not, this is not excessive. This is not isogeting. We're looking at this statement here, the raising up of another prophet, just like Moses from the brothers, you shall listen to him. It's a rep repetition here. You'll put my words, I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak all that I command him. So again, this is a big picture looking at, so when we're dealing with prophets, we are dealing with revelation. So think about this for a second. So the revelation is being complete with the coming of this, this prophet-like like Moses. Okay, everyone tracking there with me? Is everyone tracking there with me? So again, this comes back to Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 1, 1, 1 to 4. In, in, in former times, God spoke in various ways through the prophets. In these last days, he's spoken through his son. So again, here you have Moses speaking other prophets are going to come. But as Voss says, they don't, they don't create something new. They're just, they're just revealing and interacting with that which was founded by Moses. And then the people are just waiting for that greater prophet to come to complete the revelation, God's will, God's word, okay? So th this is why when we start looking for other prophets not directly connected with that, that it's brought to a climax. It's brought to an end in Christ. I, I hope everyone sees that. Okay. For, for, for today, we're focusing upon the prominence. The big takeaway here is the, the, the prominence So this is the big point I want us to see here, okay? There's many other prophets that are coming. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, so many. But at the end of the day, in Israel's day, you had Moses, and then you're looking at this prophet that's going to come, and ultimately it's going to be in Christ, in Jesus. <laughs> Go ahead. Someone wants to make a comment. Yeah, yeah, Ian. Just analyzing all of these things uh, presented before us. And in light of Isaiah 63, which is really a question, where is he, where is the prophet like Moses? Um, so, so we are saying that the subsequent prophets after Moses, uh, the basis by which you can know if the, if the particular prophet is, is coming from God, is that he must resemble like Moses. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And and in in that sense, how how did Jesus became greater than than Moses? If if Moses uh, was the one who revealed the law of God, and then the later prophets is more of uh, well well there are new uh, prophecies, but it is more like uh, an application of the law given already in the Pentateuch um, and how that particular law is applied uh, by a given prophet depending on the situation of, of Israel at that time. So I was thinking of how the Jesus became greater than all these prophets and most especially Moses. And am I right that, that Jesus displayed himself greater than all of these prophets because he was not like he was not just revealing the word of God but most importantly that that uh, he, he fulfilled the law and and the law is displayed um, in his life death and resurrection uh, so to speak so yeah no that's yeah. That I think we're wrestling through that. I think your comments are really good and insightful. And I would want to say this. I, when we say like Moses, what we would want to say right off the bat, we can say very definitively, we would want to say Moses was a prophet. He also interceded. Uh, we could say then priest. He was a priest. And then he was also a leader. Okay. So we can say, we can say that the one who is going to exemplify this, and so what you're saying is correct. As prophet, he's giving the word of God, and at the same time, he's also fulfilling. Now, now perhaps, perhaps they could not have anticipated that he would have fulfilled the law liter literally and then died on a cross. But that's what that would be like above and beyond, right? So, so that's where you're getting with with the. Uh, with the, the resurrection, the death, the sacrifice. So, so in some ways we do, we, we see that in principial form in the, in, the, in, the, in the Passover lamb, right? I just lost anything. We see that in the Passover lamb. Um, but I wanna say in this text, if we're being fair in this text, we can say objectively, he is, he is going to be like Moses at, in the prophet, priest and leader. Uh, because remember the prophet subsequent, all they were were prophets, they were just, the all they were 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 the the mouthpiece of God. You have here. This is the Levites, right? And then here, it's this is going to be in the kings, and this is going to be in David. Okay, so so you're thinking, okay, now in Israel's day, you have three different, right? You have three different functions. So then if someone shows up on the scenes doing all three of these roles, that's why, that's why we, we really minimize Jesus' prophetic function or people, we, we don't even think about Jesus' prophetic or priestly function in his life. But the whole point in the gospels is emphasizing that kingly, that kingly role He's more than a prophet. So it's like, oh, he's not a prophet. He's, he's the Messiah. It's like, no, he's a prophet and he's a priest and he's a king. So, so they could not imagine a prophet because, it's, oh, he's just another prophet. It's like, no, he's, he's more than a prophet. He is the one who was to come. So, so, you know, I think you're dead accurate, Enting, in saying that the resurrection, the fulfilling of the law, that, that's, that's above and beyond. But I think that objectively, what they should have been looking for, what, putting that aside, um, there were types and shadows pointing towards that. I don't want to minimize that. But just that's why, like, even like with Reformed Theology, the book that we're studying in leadership, right? One of those fundamental foundations of Reformed Theology is seeing Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And so here we should have been anticipating, we're going we're gonna to look in a second, that Moses was this prophet, priest, and, and leader. And we just minimize that. We really minimize that. And that, that yeah, it's so um, excellent question. And let's be thinking about that. 
let's also be looking about how, because you're right, the resurrection, the resurrection and him fulfilling the law is a whole nother added dimension to this that we cannot minimize anything. That, that, that's a great, that's a great comment, but yeah. yeah. Anyone else want to may go? I just, yeah. yeah. May I just, may I just comment uh, to the question of uh, uh, anything? Uh, to me, it's not hard to, to explain why Jesus is greater than Moses. But uh, perhaps in, the, in another sense, it might be not clear because as far as the Israelites is concerned, they look at Moses as the great prophet because of the three roles he played. And so when they were looking at the greater prophet, greater than Moses, they were thinking of somebody who will do more than just a prophet, more than just a priest, and more than a leader in relation to the restoration of Israel as a glorious nation, which was originally planned by God as, as the promised land uh, during uh, prior to the exile to Babylon. So when Jesus came and it was not being realized, in the way the Israelites imagined the glory of Israel, they rejected Jesus. But Jesus was an was focused on his role as just not just another prophet, but a great prophet, not just an ordinary priest, but a high priest, not just uh, an ordinary, but the kingly leader. That is what the Israelites failed to see in Christ. I think that's the one that, that was missing in this point. But as to the question that he is greater, he is greater because he did something even greater than Moses, especially on that aspect of dying on the cross. They did not think about that. Even perhaps Moses did not think about that, that the prophet that would come after him would die for Israel himself and then resurrect again or live again. I think even Moses would not have thought about that. Yeah. Okay. No, that's really good. And uh, that's really good, Attorney Boboy. We're, 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 we're thinking here. Go ahead, Henry. Go ahead. Uh, Moses come in during the time of the Israelites and Jesus come in also during the time of the Jew. Okay. Uh, Moses come in in a leadership form, whereas Jesus come in in a servant form, low, lowly. So that's the two different, uh, two different. So the Israelites could not take it. They were looking for another Moses who will lead them out, okay? Moses lead them out. Jesus, did not, they did not see that Jesus was leading them out. Okay, last thing. In Deuteronomy 18.15, who was saying this? The Lord your God will raise you up for you a prophet. This is not Moses. It is Moses, like me, right. like me. Moses, it's, yeah. Moses right? And that Moses is saying this, but on verse 17, verse 17, and the Lord said to me, so the Lord said to Moses, they are right in what you have spoken. I will raise, verse 18, I will raise up for, for them a prophet like you from among their, their brothers. So Moses was telling the people that someone, somebody which is greater than me will come. So yeah. it's like, Moses telling the people, someone greater than me, you obey him. Verse 19, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So it's like, hey, I give my crown to somebody. You listen to him. No, no. so this is the connection. H Henry, I want to go back to what Boboy said, and I want to also, I want to piggyback what you both said. Excellent points. So look at this, look at this. So, so this is just to make it really clear. They're fearing the voice of God. So God's voice is literal on the mountain and they're afraid of it. So, so God is saying, yes, it's correct. They are right in what they're, they are afraid. And so the whole implication is God is going, he's going to send himself. His voice is going to be there because Diba, Moses' voice is not God's voice. Diba? So this is why it's so much greater because they're terrified of the Lord Almighty's voice. So God's like, I'm going to send someone, my presence, another voice. And that's the living word. That's the living word. Think about how amazing that is. Excellent, excellent comment, Henry. You, you, you get the platinum star. Excellent point there. I, 
I did not even really see that. So excellent job. Queer Bull Boy, coming back to your comments, perhaps part of the difficulty was they were thinking, so we're thinking biblical theological framework and also bad interpretation, right? So maybe they're thinking, they're focusing on what you're saying, the restoration of Israel. So they're thinking more of just the kingly role. They're not considering the, Le the Levitical or the, the prophetic role. Yeah. Um, and they're thinking in their focus is on the shadow and the type. <laughs> the shadow and the type. But Jesus is focused on the spiritual, the sin, dealing with sin, dealing with the heart issue, the eternal kingdom to come. So it's it's like there this is why we have to have the biblical, biblical theological framework. We cannot be focused upon the shadow and the type. We can't be going back there in, in our in our in our way of thinking. So um, anyone else want to add? I think these are great. I'm just so happy. <clears throat> Excellent work. You guys are thinking. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Uh, uh, as far as the the religious leaders at the time, I don't think they really did not know that Jesus was a greater prophet because it was even stated in the book, the Bible, that they knew, but it was just they were jealous of him that they, they, they don't want to lose their probably their speech as leaders. So that was the reason behind that. But as to knowing him as really the, uh, the, the prophet that was sent, I think they, they knew it for a fact. They just don't want to accept him. Yeah, no, so so you could be right on there, Ray. I would say that specifically, it's uh it's uh Matthew 12, they ask for the sign. And so Jesus says an evil and adulterous sign, uh, evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. So they're really asking for this sign. They're asking for this sign here. The the the, the, the sign that confirms. The sign that confirms. So so that's why Jesus says an evil and adulterous. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. So the crazy thing, they, they want a sign. And Jesus says, no sign will be given except for the, he gave them a sign. He gave them a sign and it's the resurrection. So going the full circle back to Enting's comment, the resurrection was the validation that Jesus was the prophet. <laughs> crazy. Tim, Tim, just, just, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, just, 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 maybe, I don't know. Um, so, so we're looking at the net subsequent prophets, and and Moses was really unique because he was a leader, and uh, so somehow these three, three roles, although, like for example, as a king, it, it, yeah. king in a sense that he was leading the people of yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. So. And then, and then the, the promise that there would be a prophet like Moses coming. Mm -hmm. And we know that the next prophets were not the one whom God is really pointing to. Yeah. Because they were not able to play these three roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and these three roles was really um, uh, fulfilled yeah. in, in Jesus. And that is why we can say that Jesus was the fulfillment of that yeah. because he played these three roles yes. or maybe yeah. even fulfilled this, yeah. these three roles. Yeah. Yeah. No, excellent, excellent. Yeah. And, and so just piggybacking, just sorry, and then you, you so, so that's the case, I do want to add what Henry said. I do want to add what Henry said. The, the voice of God. So the other thing too is that the, the, this is the, the presence, the presence of the voice of God in a, in a special way because they're terrified. They're terrified of that voice. Um, Moses does not fulfill that. Even though Moses is giving the words, he is not that voice. Okay. So although this is vague, this is hidden. The Lord says, they are right. They are right in what they have spoken. And so then th the response to that is this. I will raise up for them another prophet like you. So although it's not really explicit, the point is that we're looking for some prophet that is the voice of God. 
in the beginning was the word <laughs> and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so so it's it's fundamentally the prophet priest and king but it's also the voice of god and so um i did not have that in my notes so uh henry gets the platinum star he gets the platinum star oh my goodness that's really good henry um okay we have to go we have to fly we're behind but in hebrews 3 1 to 6 moses is the servant in the house of god jesus is the builder <laughs> so maybe if we meet on sunday night uh this past sunday it was my mistake i shared a message that we were going to meet but I just sent it to the leaders. I did not send it to the whole group. So I apologize for that. I realized that today. I'm like, why did no one show up? And I went back and looked at my message and it was just to the leaders. Like it was not to the group. So I apologize for that. Um, but what we'll probably do is if we have time this Sunday night, we'll look at John six and then also Hebrews three, one to six. So we're really looking at the relationship more of, of, of Moses and Jesus. Moses is the servant in the house of God. Jesus is the son and in fact, the builder of the house himself. But needless to say, the, the, the big perspective that I want us to see in Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, um, this is a side, this is background, this is not foreground. In the background is that Moses and Jesus are being compared and contrasted. And again, there's no other prophet. We're focusing upon the prominence of Moses. There's no other prophet in the Old Testament where there's a comparison like this. So, um, uh, even though Jesus is so much greater than Moses, Moses is the one that's prominent. And for our purposes, he's the one that's being questioned and denigrated and, and rejected by a lot of scholarship. Okay. Uh, let's just, let's finish the points here. And this is actually going to get to what we're discussing, okay? The typical relation of Christ can easily be traced in each of the three offices we are accustomed to distinguish in the soteric work of Christ. So soteric just means the salvific, the, the work of salvation of Christ, okay? So these are the three positions. Um, prophet, eight, uh, uh, prophet in Deuteronomy 18.15 uh, reaching the culmination in the Messiah like unto Moses, okay? So we, we just highlighted that. Uh, Exodus 24, 4 to 8, Moses is the priest. He carries out the priestly function, intercession, making sacrifice for the peoples. Uh, typically, prophet is God speaking to man. Priest is man speaking to God. So Moses carries them both out. And then in the comparison, we have Moses uh, uh, mediating for the people in the old covenant, and that's looking towards uh, Christ going to mediate the new covenant. Number three, Moses intercedes for Israel after the commission of the sin of the golden calf. So we looked at this in Bible's big story. If I can ever get the rest of the videos uh, up on the YouTube, you can go back and watch our ex examination of the Bible's big story. And here we really unpack the intercession of Moses. It is crazy. The intercession of Moses you, you, you read that intercession. He literally offers himself and his own life on behalf of the people. It's just like Christ. It's like, oh my goodness. Like you could not have written. It's like, it's, 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 it's a, it's a four, it's a foreshadow of Christ. And so uh, Moses is um, uh, vicar a person vicariously bearing punishment of the guilty Exodus 32, 30 to 33. And, um, in connection with this, we have this royal figure. So although Moses is, you cannot, we cannot call him a king. Okay. But he is the, he is the one by which God is exercising his lordship at this time over. He is the mediator. So in that sense, he is the leader. He is carrying out the kingly function, although we don't want to call him a king. And in many ways, that's still um, uh, deficient compared to the coming of Christ, who will carry out these offices perfectly, prophet, priest, and king. Okay, now we're on to B, the mode of revelation in the Mosaic period. So now we're on to B, the mode of revelation in the Mosaic period. So we looked at the prominence of Moses, 
Now we're going to look at the form or mode. So, so the word used by Voss is form, form, okay? Here, we must distinguish between the revelation directly communicated to and through the person of Moses on the one hand. So there's revelation directly communicated to Moses, and then he communicates it to the people. And then the form, the forms of revelation emerging at the time. So there's other forms that, that God will speak through. And it's not just to, it's not just to Moses, other people, other leaders, the priests, they see these forms. Even the people themselves see the forms. Number one. So we're just going to review here. We don't, we're not going to go into the text. You can write the text down. So just looking first now. So this is little I. God's revelation. God's revelation to Moses. We find special clearness and directness affirmed by the intercourse between Moses and God. There is no prophet who was honored with that direct and continuous access to Jehovah Moses enjoyed. In this respect, Moses also prefigures Christ. So, so Enting asked how. We talked about fundamentally those three, those three priestly, uh, th th not priestly, those three offices. We also talked about how he's going to be the voice of God. Here, there's also this, this unique communion between Moses and God that no other prophet really has. And then it's at a whole nother level when Christ comes. It's at a whole nother level, whole nother level of, of, of communion, of, of, of relationship. So again, uh, Exodus 33, Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. As Christ reveals the Father in virtue of a most direct an uninterpreted vision of him and not in result of isolated communication. So Moses, through a lower degree, stands nearer to God and is more in all that he speaks and does the mouthpiece of God than any subsequent prophet. So again, we're saying the same thing, uh, similar things, but again, we're looking at that relationship between Moses and um, Christ. And so that's all I have. That's all I have for us, um, for, for Moses. Uh, now let's go on to... Uh, Little Roman numeral number two, other forms of God's revelation during the Mosaic period. And so what are these forms? Can anyone name them? Can anyone name the four forms that Voss brings out? Pillar of cloud. Pillar of cloud, the angel of, the the angel of Jehovah. The name and the face of God. Wow, boy, boy. So we have the pillar, the angel of the Lord, the face of God, in the name of God. Name Jehovah. So, I want us to be, we're thinking about types and shadows, prefigures. That also describes Jesus Christ, right? Those are prefiguring the work of Jesus. It's amazing. The forms of revelation during this period are, as was mentioned, the pillar and the cloud. The angel of Jehovah, the name of Jehovah, the face of Jehovah. These have in common that they express, this is big. This is huge. Write it down. Learn it. Love it. Live it. Because we're on the way. We're on the way to God's presence with us, okay? These have in common that they express the permanence of the divine presence and are distinguished in that respect from the fleeting ephemeral forms, ephemeral forms of manifestation in the patriarchal period. So if you recall, it's at night. It's really like vague. They're afraid. It's dark. It's just like a vision. And that's it. It's gone. That's it. Right? God comes and goes and there's no, there's no rhyme or reason. Right? Now we have divine presence is there. Now what we want to do next is we want to look at the, so now I'm going to go big picture, okay? We're going to go and look at the presence of God from pre-fall until, until this point in, in Revelation history, okay? Let's look at this now.
These have in common that they express the permanence. Okay, we, we said that. The significance can be understood only if it can be placed in the larger setting of the divine communication with mankind in general. Okay, so we're looking at, we're looking at just, there is a restatement here, so let me just highlight. We're looking at the statement here. I've got to work on my writing ability. Oh my goodness. I got to work on that. Number one, before the fall, there was such an ab abiding presence of God with man in paradise. Okay, so it's abiding. It's remaining. It's always there. He's receiving the presence of God, um, and especially through natural revelation, right? So he sees, so, so there's, 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 there's a presence of God in the garden. He's receiving natural, he, it's, it's not being affected by the fall. Uh, after the fall, a certain remnant of this continued, though not in the old gracious form, it continues, okay? So the throne of cherubim stood in the east. They could see that, right? They could see the, 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 the cherubim standing in the east of the garden of God. God still walked with Noah. He still walked with Enoch. Then Voss says, after the flood, all this changed. God, as it were, with, withdrew himself this sacramental revelation presence into heaven. So it's as if God withdraws, right? He withdraws himself. Even God speaking with, with Cain and he just withdraws himself. This, however, was an, an abnormal state of things for the ultimate design of all of God's uh, of, is to converse with man that he may make his abode with his people. So remember this. We're looking at God's goal. It's for him to dwell with us and for us to experience his presence. So this is why, brothers and sisters, maybe I'm going to speak strongly here. This is why the natural man does not receive the things of God. This is why we, without the work of the Spirit, you, you ask people on the street, do you want to go to heaven? And of course, they'll say yes, because they don't want to go to hell. Or maybe there's a lot of good things in heaven. They think there's things, right? There's, but if you say, you ask anyone that's an unbeliever that that does that the spirit of God is not working on their heart, and you ask them this question, they will never say, "I want to be in the presence of God. <laughs> I want to dwell with God in His presence." It's because that's the goal, and that's what we want. But the natural man does not receive that. The natural man has no desire to be with God. We're like Cain. We just want to leave. We want to go do our own thing. It's only the supernatural work of God through his spirit. When he opens our blind eyes, he opens our deaf ears. He removes this heart of stone that we see things as they are. And we, we cling in faith and we desire to be in the presence of God because we see and savor him for who he is. Going back to our question last week, no self-righteous person really values that. A self-righteous person really doesn't care about the presence of God. They just want to preserve themselves. They want, to, they want to exalt their kingdom. They want to exalt their righteousness. So number five is so fundamental in evangelism, getting to heart issues of people. Are we just presenting a gospel that's cheap, that's, that's hollow, or are we presenting before people that that they need and they're chasing after pursuits that were never satisfied. And the reason is because their satisfaction can only be in the presence of God. And until they have that heart change, until they cry out for God to give them that heart change, everything else is striving in the wind. This also will bring new significance to prayer. <laughs> Because it's the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit. We need to be praying for people twice as much as we share the gospel with them. Five times as much as we share the gospel with them. We need to be praying that the Spirit would open their eyes, unclog their ears, change their heart of stone, so that they see God for who He is. That the veil in their heart would be lifted. That they would see the glory of Christ. Consequently, from now on, Revelation tends towards the realization of this design. So this is the goal of Revelation, the presence of God, the presence of God. So Christ coming on the scene, the presence of God in the flesh, 
is just radical. It's, it's insane. Let's just take a minute here. Let's just talk through this for a minute. What's your reaction? What's your reflection upon this? What, what are your thoughts so far? Just let's talk. Just recently, Sir Tim, um, <clears throat> just realized this by, you know, uh, I have my book by John Piper, Brothers, You Are Not Professional. Uh, I, I do it actually uh, as a, a daily de devotions like and with the Bible also. And it strike me the chapter three where he proposed that very striking that people cannot even accept it. The statement that God loves his own glory. Yeah. And there is a trace, John Piper trace that all over the scripture and there is there is a statement in Isaiah chapter, I think it's chapter 48 that I will not bring, I will not give my glory to anyone. And it's really, you know, it's, it's striking truth that, that, that even when we share the gospel, we try to share the, you know, I have been evangelizing for, for, for days now. And then people would really, that's true that people will, will say, yes, I want to go to heaven, but heaven, but I just want to go there by my own might, <laughs> my own good works. It's really killing. And then, um, yeah, as long as uh, I just realized now, uh, the, the, the meat of the gospel is God himself, the glory of God himself. If we are not going to, to present the holiness of God, the uniqueness of God, and then our un and holiness, then the people would not really fall down and, and repent. And then I uh, just realized that. And some, you know, yeah, it's mocking at, at us. That's, that's really yeah. true. true. <laughs> when, you, when you're, you know, evangelizing in the street, yeah. people will eventually mock you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Your, <laughs> your God is unseen. We are now in yeah. the middle of pandemic. We need him. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, he's silent. So, yeah. Um, so, no, yeah, that's, that, that, yeah. That's 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 good. That we want. There is various aspects of God, like His glory. Absolutely, I, I do think here the emphasis that Boss is making, and the emphasis even in the Garden, is is uh, the the communication, though, the presence for communication and fellowship. So. Um, yeah, it, these other parts, the glory of, absolutely, the glory of God. Yes, that, that, that's part of it. But I think here it's this, this, this fellowship. And, and, and I don't think many of us value or an unbeliever would value the fellowship of God just in of itself. They would rather hang out with their friends. They'd rather hang out with their, their, their people they like. Uh, anything, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, the development of, of this theme on <clears throat> God's revelation through his presence is, is really wonderful because <clears throat> um, from individual people, so we have the patriarchs, um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where God says, I'm, I'm with you. <clears throat> and then he, he displayed himself through the tabernacle in the midst of his people and and then later on on the temple um where god displays himself and yeah very radical when when jesus became the that temple yeah, when yeah. he said uh you no longer worship me in this mountain or mm. or that mountain um and the time has come and and it it clearly refers to himself yeah and and so that is so radical that the presence of God really uh, incarnated in a person, and and after that one, the, the radical thing about it after that is that every every one of us believer um, is indwelt by God, indwelt yeah, by, yeah, by by the presence of God. So th that's that is a theme in Scripture that we believers should should be able to. Um, appreciate yeah um because he's not without us but within yeah. us yeah and yeah. it's all because of, of the incarnate presence yeah. of god yeah excellent jesus christ mm. no that that's really good that's really good ending and so to piggyback what ending saying like with our daughter when we're sharing the gospel with her you know we're of course sharing with her and trying to, to reveal to her that she's a sinner but we also ask about if she wants the presence of God with her. And, and part, maybe part of it she doesn't understand, part of it she's afraid. But 
but she has she's not ready to 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 to, to have Jesus the Holy Spirit in her heart and so that's a sign that she's not yet ready that's a sign that she's not yet ready so even my wife's like no we cannot we cannot yet we cannot yet lead her we, we, she's not yet there and and you know I want to lead her I want to lead her in the in the prayer because sometimes she's like yes daddy I want I want I want Jesus but then when we when we get down to those so what I'm trying to get at is kind of what Enting is talking about as well is ask those hard questions that really reveal someone's heart and you can tell if they're ready to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior or if they're not and so you know we we want people to to submit to the lordship of Jesus that is the greatest command uh in connection with with loving God and loving others at the same time we cannot fabricate false converts there's a balance here there's a balance here okay let, let's move on here it's getting late but we, we're we're good okay uh the pillar of cloud and fire explore exodus 19 1 to 18 so um okay we might touch here let's go through the powerpoint and we might we might look at we might look at just just a minute exodus 19 but um Looking at this, the revelation of the presence of God, it's there all the time for the people to see now, right? In the patriarchs, they could not see the presence of God. Now it's present in the pillar of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So maybe looking here, going back to the comment as far as the, the fire, the fire is more in, in that sense as far as light. It's giving off light at night. So that could be the sense in which the glory of God um, Fire and consuming fire is, is heat and destruction. But anyway, uh, number one, it protected the people. So the, the God's pillar, this is revealing the presence of God. It protected the people. Exodus 14. Exodus 16, the glory of God appeared in the cloud when the people doubted. So we don't know exactly how that was. We can explore that Exodus 16. But what Voss brings out is that um, not only was the cloud protection so the presence of god it protected the people it also uh, god's glory appeared in it god comes in the cloud and here exodus 19 if we have time we'll come back and look at this passage here uh the, the lord coming in the cloud on the mountain was terrifying it was absolutely terrifying for the people and this is when the people said, don't let God speak to us. We will die. You speak to us. It's crazy. They did not even want, they had the presence of God in their midst, but he was a consuming fire and, it, and they did not actually want it. And so, you know, maybe that also speaks to us when we actually see the God's power in raw form. <laughs> Our flesh might not want his presence. That, that's, that's a crazy thing to think about. The cloud on Mount Sinai also contained the glory of God and is described as a consuming fire, a devouring fire. So this was probably just insanely terrifying for the people. And then lastly, the cloud descends and stands in the front of the door of the provisional tent pitched in Moses. So this is, again, a presence of God for worship. So these are different ways in which God appeared. And so, um, yeah, I'll just refer you to look at Exodus 19 on your own. But if you, if you look at it, you really can see that it's, it's the coming of the Lord. It's the coming of the Lord. And it's also anticipating uh, uh, in the New Testament, the coming, Jesus will come again in the clouds, right? Bobby, go ahead. There's a question, but uh, both did not answer. This number, this last point, the cloud descends and sun in front. Where did it descend? From the mountain or from heaven? Both did not answer that question. Yeah. What do you think? I would imagine if it's this is this is beyond this is beyond the scope. Yeah. This is beyond the scope. <laughs> but I would but I would imagine if the cloud was still on the mountain, they would have seen the presence because the cloud was symbolizing the presence of God. So I would say my my feeling would be it would have descended from the mountain and stood in front. And in some way it has to it has to become small, right? It cannot the mountain is very big. And so um yeah, so Again, that's very, that's very interpretative. It's, you know, because when they saw the, the cloud descend from heaven, it was terrifying. It was like, it was, it was not a cloud like we see today. It was more like a, a probably like a, a tornado or a, 
<laughs> or a thunderstorm. It was it was it was probably a th it was probably ter absolutely terrifying. terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. Let's go there. I'm going to go there. Let's just read it. I, I, we, let, let's read it for those of you who, let, let, let's, I, I, I have to do it. I'm sorry. I have to do it. Exodus 19. I'm just going to read. And you can just see, you can see this and experience this. And this also is pointing towards Christ's return. Christ is coming in the clouds. And so this is a example. This is an example of what Christ's return will be like. Okay. This is the type also for the coming of Christ in the clouds. Okay. So the Lord came. Uh, and the reason why we can be sure of this is when you compare Exodus 19 with Revelation 7 and 8, there's a lot of parallels between Christ coming in the clouds and, and, and the Lord coming in a cloud to this mountain. So, so um, I actually also have a video on that. Maybe I'll try to share that as well um, on, on, uh, on YouTube. On the third moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, and on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. They encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain of the Lord. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called out to him in the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. God owns the earth. <laughs> and you shall be to me kingdom of priests, a holy nation. The words that I shall speak, uh, that you shall speak to the people, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came out and called the elders of the people and set before them these words that the Lord had commanded them. The people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people, uh, and Moses reported the words of the people to the to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud. So this is the mode. That the people may hear when I speak to you, and you may also believe forever. So the coming of the Lord is, is, is for belief, right? And this is, this is the case here. This, this is going to reveal those people that had a true relationship with God, they were not terrified. Those that did not, they were terrified. That is really the reality. When Moses heard the words of, of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready on the third day. Three days. <laughs> wow. On the third day, the Lord will come down. On the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So again, this revelation now is for all the people to see. This again is dealing with mood. This, this revelation is not private. Patriarchs, it's all private. This is public. This is a public revel revelation. You shall set limits for the people around saying, take care not to go up on the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch it, but he shall be shown stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. And when the trumpet sound blasts, so Jesus is going to descend with the trumpet sound. So Jesus is coming in the clouds. <laughs> there's a trumpet. Okay, so <laughs> this is why there's multiple... Th there's multiple connections here. They shall come on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people. They washed their garments and said to the people, be, re be ready on the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and the thick cloud on the mountain. So this is, have you ever been in the midst of a thunderstorm with big lightning? And tornadoes has anyone experienced that it's terrifying i've been in some big anyone give us give a story in, i give think you miss out uh, yolanda we have <laughs> <laughs> you, you're asking the right people <laughs> okay yolanda would be an example yolanda is the example no that if you were to Yes. Okay. I apologize. Please forgive me. I, I am sorry. I I was very insensitive. Yes, Yolanda 
the picture is not a cloud that we see like today it was a beautiful day the clouds are just going across no it's peaceful this is a terrifying sight like yolanda there was thunder lightnings a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that the people were terrified then moses brought the people out of the camp to meet god they took and they stood at the foot of the mountain Sinai was wrapped in smoke. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln. That's like thick and black, and it's going up to this. It's just, it's, it's, uh, what's the word? Like, um, it's just, it's, it's not, a, it's not a nice feeling. It's a feeling. I was in, I was outside in the middle one time, and there was like this big smoke going up, and I was like, there's a fire somewhere. And I was afraid because it was near my house. So we got in our car and I'm driving to my house. I was afraid that there was like, every plate thing was on fire. And as I'm driving there, I look over to the field and they were burning all the basura. <laughs> but what I'm saying is when that smoke is going up, it's, it's terrifying, it's terrifying. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled. So the, the whole mountain shaking. The whole mountain is trembling greatly. I mean, this is terrifying. Right? You go to the mountain for security, right? People flee to the mountain for security. If the mountain is shaking, where will you go? The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Here we go. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. The Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break out through, the, through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. And the priests come near and consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. Moses says, the people cannot come up to the mountain for you yourself warned us, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. The Lord said, go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. Do not let the, peace, the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. This is, this is a terrifying sight. And this is a revelation for us of God, of God as a consuming fire. And this would be in judgment. This, is, this image is so terrifying. Does anyone want to comment? Uh, in, <clears throat> just, just a question of... Uh, yeah hermeneutics because uh, for us we look at scripture uh, as a whole we can right away see the connection um, between the second coming of jesus and the first coming of jesus but it's a big leap it's a big jump from from exodus all the way to Je to, to revelation and so uh, for us to cease that hermeneutics um, because the scripture is whole. What is that particular theme in here that we can safely say that this prefigures yeah. the second coming of, of Jesus? Yeah. yeah. So, so we're looking now at parallel concepts and constructs and looking at the two. So when Jesus says, I'm going to be coming in the clouds in judgment and every eye will see me, all of that, that's all, those are all similar and almost the same here. All of Israel saw, all of Israel saw the Lord coming. The Lord came in a cloud. So, so, so when you're just exegetically, so exegetically, there's a lot of parallel images that's, that's going on. Okay. So, um, um, that would be exegetically, you're, you're looking at parallel uh, images and, and, and the words. So the Greek or the Hebrew will almost be the same. So um, I would say that's exegetically. And then you're right. If you don't have this framework, if you're not looking at how the Lord comes in judgment, then yes, it's going to be hard to see that. But when you look at previous examples of the Lord coming in judgment in Sodom, uh, in judgment of Adam and Eve, it's it's you you see you start to see a pattern 
And so when you look at the pattern, when, when, when God comes in judgment against Israel and the prophets, okay, you're seeing this pattern unfold. And then when, when Jesus comes on the scene and then he says, I'm coming again, um, um, and it's it, every eye will see him, every, every eye will, will mourn. There's just, it, the, the, the proof just becomes so strong. So I would agree with you, Enting, that if you're just looking at a wooden literal, um, you would never make the connection. But if you're looking at similar events, you're looking at similar concepts, um, Jesus is the Lord. You just can't miss it. A loud trumpet's going to blow. <laughs> a loud trumpet blows when Christ comes. <laughs> it's the same. The trumpet of the archangel comes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a great question. But I, I do think it's, it's a comprehensive look. You're looking exegetically. You're looking at biblical theological, the framework. And then you're also looking at, at, at theology as well. It, it, it's really a multifaceted approach. Go ahead, Anthony, if you want to follow up. Anyone else want to make a comment or? or? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, okay. Bullboy was first and then Sonny. So Bullboy had yeah, the, okay. the slip on the draw. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is precisely this fearsome and how will, whatever, whatever adjective you, you can describe because sometimes it's difficult to, to describe the situation of fear in front of a powerful God. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why would God really, really emphasize this much to the Israelites at the time, knowing that with foreknowledge, they will be fearful and then they would say to Moses, do not let the hearts hear God voice yeah. or else yeah. we die. You just talk to God. Yeah. You just talk to us. Yeah. Uh, was that also a way of a way of uh, placing something in between God and man, which is again related to His power or the, His 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 principle of election? Is it related to the principle of election? So, let me an answer your first question: Why would God approach the people like He did? Right, Diba? That's the question. So what I would say is that, yeah, so what I would say is that they did not see God. They saw just a physical revelation of him, but they did not see him in his full power. God actually says, no one can look on me and live, okay? So what I want to say first off the bat is, is God's desire is for man to be in his presence. Um, and God, and because looking at his glory, looking at who he is, but not only for Israel, but for us, God is showing that his, he is an awesome, all-powerful God. And, and without, without, without proper safeguards, without proper, we, we cannot, God is this all-consuming, perfect, holy God. And just even coming on the mountain, um, in one sense, he is in the presence of the people. In another sense, the bottom of the mountain is consecrated. The, the people cannot be in the presence. They will all die because of the, of, of the perfect. And so what I would say is that God is revealing who he is, and it is terrifying. And so um, he is revealing to the world who he is to us. And so that, you know, this comes back, boy, boy, it's, it's, it's a God-centered, not man-centered. So man-centered would be like, God should tame it down. God's like, no, God said, you will see me for who I am and be terrified. Don't worry, I'll send my son and still protect you. <laughs> okay, but he's showing himself who he is. It is, it is raw. It is, it is, um, it is a God-centered perspective. He is, he is, uh, he wants us to see him, if possible, for, for who he is. And there's many reasons for that. Number one, so that they will trust him. If they see this all-powerful God, then and he's fighting for you, going in late, they should have trusted like, dude, man, this guy, he's going to destroy all, Jericho's done. If that cloud comes down, Jericho, done. Do you see what I'm saying? They should have just believed. When they saw that terrifying sight, and then God's like, I'm going to go fight for you, there should have been no doubt. You should be like, man, we got the crazy guy. We got the crazy guy. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but we got, we got the insane fire he's in control right so so el shaddai is 
the one who overcomes nature. He's in control of the of the hurricane. He's in control of the of the lightning. He's got all that. He's going to fight for us. All we have to do is believe. So, so there is a positive when you see God for who he is. That's why the purpose here, they may believe forever. If they had, if they had, tr- if they had the spirit working, if they had eyes to see, they would have believed. And, and remember, belief is submit, trust, and, and obedience, right? So they would have believed forever. But the people did not have true belief. They, they were unbelieving. And so there was this fear. Um, uh, maybe that answers part of your question. Um, it is hard to imagine why we would say like, I would not want to, ter- I would never, I never want to terrify my, my daughter with, with my, my, my with my wrath, right? We, I would not want to do that or show her my strength. Um, yeah, so it, it is hard. It is, there's that hard part. And then there is that, that other part. Um, we'll go to Kaya and then, and then Sunny. I, I'm not forgetting you, Sunny. Just go ahead, Kaya, because maybe you want to interact with what we're saying. Oh. I want to add something, Pastor Tim, because I was thinking of the same thing, that those who actually believe in God, after seeing who He is, they won't be afraid. Yes. It's Uh, like, yes, yes, because you have that personal connection to God. You you know, you are actually confident. It's because it's like accepting God of who He is. Even if you see Him terrifying and all, because He is God. That yeah. is who he is. And if you accept him as who he is, yeah. you won't be terrified at all. Rather, you would feel that pride within you yeah. that yeah. you are you are with him. No, it's, that's, that's accurate. It. Excellent. No, that's really true. And it, it comes down to, 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 to belief and, and trust. Excellent, excellent uh, comment, Kaya. Um, uh, Sonny, go ahead. You want, I, I'm sorry, we, we, we kind of, Bobo Bo- Bo- yeah. got you first though. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's that's right. Actually, uh, my question is regarding to the exegetical issues of his coming in the cloud. Um, uh, Actually, uh, I'm reading, um, I was reading uh, J.K. Bale's Handbook of the New Testament Views of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And it's really good. And uh, one thing that I have a question in mind, which he did not uh, extend, uh, why did the New Testament uh, always quoted the letter documents, which means they did the prophet, the, the prophet documents instead of the mosaic documents. Now, at this point, we have this, this statement here in Exodus chapter 19 of, of uh, you know, coming on the clouds. But we have also the, the same statement, which reinforced by Daniel in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is kind of about coming in the clouds. And, it is, and, and Jesus always refers not on that Exodus, but on that Daniel and even in, in even, even Revelations often called Daniels and Zechariahs. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that's that's my question. Why no, because, that, because, that? because, <laughs> no, so because even, so look, I, I'm i pretty sure Bill would say this, that even in the Old Testament, so you have later prophets quoting earlier. So later prophets are quoting the law and then you have Jesus in the New Testament quoting the prophets. So the reason why they're they're making the connection to the prophets is because that's the next closest that's the that's the next closest fulfillment right so jesus is literally fulfilling the son of man coming in the clouds but that son of man coming in the clouds is then pointing back to this and the the craziest thing is that the son of man coming in the clouds is actually got the lord, the lord himself coming in the clouds so throughout the prophets you also have the coming of yahweh and so in, in saying the coming of yahweh in the prophets that's also how do we how is Yahweh going to come in the prophets the same way he came even to a greater extent in in here so what i would say sonny is this this is not the prototype of the coming of the lord the prototype of the coming of the lord is in genesis when he comes in judgment of adam and eve but this is an earlier an earlier type and so it, 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 it it's going along this trajectory okay so so G- jesus and, and, and Beale picks up on this, that I'm pretty sure that, you know, Jesus is going to quote where it's already brought to climax so far in the Old Testament. It's not yet climactic. It's still, it, but it's, they're going to go the next closest, but they can quote any part along that line and we should, we should pick up on it. So other times though, um, out of Egypt, I've called my son. So looking at Hosea, that's being applied to Jesus and that's pointing back to the Exodus. So 
it's all we're all being faithful to the text. So I, I don't know if I answered the question, but what I would say is that, and what what Beale would say is that it's you could you could pick up any place they pick up on it because that's where it is. That would be that would have been the clearest example in the common day. Um, maybe that's what that's yeah. what he's emphasizing. Yeah. Yeah, well, probably because uh, I was thinking of, of because the you know the New Testament era, the first coming to the second coming is living in the eschatological concept. That's why they quoted the eschatological prophetic book instead of the mosaic book. Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I was thinking that way. Well, no, because there, it, it, like so. For example, let me just be clear. Okay, so Jesus, let's be clear, Sonny. So Jesus quotes. The sun, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, right? Okay, so that's Daniel, okay? Jesus says in, in, in Revelation 1, 7, and 8, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, in, in the cloud, and, and, and that's also could be a reference to Daniel um, uh, as well. But when you look at the presence of the coming of, of uh, in, in, when, you, when you look at the presence of the coming of, the presence of the trumpet, Coming in fire, uh, Hebrews 12, uh, 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 1 Thessalonians, I think, 4, 4 and 5, 4. They're still picking up on these concepts. So what I would say is that they have in mind, even if they're quoting the, the later ones, Paul and Jesus have in mind this as well. So I don't know if that's making sense. So I, I'm saying maybe, maybe it's more of an accent there. The trumpet is not. I don't know if there's really a trumpet in, in the coming of the man, the the, the, the son of man, in the clouds. There's no reference to trumpet there, is there? Oh yes. No. There's no trumpet. There's no trumpet in the son of yeah, man coming in the right. clouds, right? So when Paul mm -hmm. says the man, so Jesus is coming in the clouds, and there's going to be the the trumpet of the archangel. It's not just. It's not <laughs> Daniel. It's he's coming back to here. So that's why it's 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 mm -hmm. it's like a false. It's a false dichotomy. When I a false dichotomy is it's not really it, we're, we're we're splitting things that we shouldn't need to split, they're all connected. Yeah. So so and, and I'm pretty sure Beal would agree with that because he talks about that as well, and that's how he that's how he defends that they are quoting the right text. I'm pretty sure he'd agree with me on that. Correct doctrine in the wrong text. <laughs> yeah, but, but like what, yeah, what I'm saying is that he he's I'm I'm pretty much just expanding upon his arguments. What I'm saying, yeah, yeah. sharing it. Okay, great. Anyone else want to add? We're going to finish. We're almost done. Uh, we started late, so so I'm not late. I'm still early. Okay, so let's let's go back to the text. Let's try to finish this here. We're almost done here. Um, let's finish the PowerPoint. Next slide number twenty. So we got three more, and we're done. Uh, the angel of the Lord. So we really unpacked the angel of the Lord last week. Um, we'll come back to the angel of the Lord uh, with the name, the name of, of of the Lord and the content, as Bullboy mentioned. But what we want to see here is that this issue of the angel of the Lord as being representative of, of the Lord himself is, is just gross. So it's all, it's all over Mosaic Revelation. So God appears to Moses in the burning bush, but in fact, it's the angel of the Lord. Okay, so that's explicit in, in Exodus 3. Okay, so... The second way that God's appearing, he, he continues from the patriarchal period using the angel of the Lord, okay? So this is, uh, this is the same as the patriarchal period. So he continues this vision, um, uh, this type of, of revelation, okay? So those are three references that you can look at. There's debate concerning um, an angel. God offers to send an angel with them to, to protect the way, right? He's like, you're a stiff neck and stubborn people. I, I'm not going to go with you. I'll just send an angel. Okay. Um, we can discuss that on Sunday night if you want. You don't have to, but we can discuss that. But the bottom line that 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 Voss says, and I agree with him, is that the, an angel that God offers is not the angel of the Lord that designates his presence. Okay, so there's two different there, and the text is clear on that. So Voss brings that out, and I would agree with him as well, strongly. So our interpretation, and really, which is really Voss's interpretation of the angel of the Lord as a unique uh, being that's been created to, 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 to signify to the people the presence of God in a special way, 
in a very special way that's more than an angel, but not God himself in the literal sense, okay? More than an angel, but not God in his literal self, because, because God cannot be in the presence of man. No one can live, okay? So we need to, we need to maintain that, um, that, 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 that balance there. Um, okay. Um, the third, the name of the Lord. So the name of Jehovah is going to go with them. The name we encountered in Exodus 23, 21, it's, it's, uh, it's affirmed. It's in the angel. So this is what Boboy said last week, that the name, the word, the angel, the presence, it's, it's all one. You can't separate. So wherever the name of Yahweh is, his presence is there. And so, uh, there is power in the name. Okay, so we've heard that before, that statement. And so uh, that's another way that God is revealing himself through his name. So in the statement of his name, the name Jehovah, we'll discuss the name. It's not, it would, some people say it's Yahweh. There's different ways of interpreting it. Um, um, I think that maybe God protected it because the way they're disrespecting names today um, it's, maybe it's providential that 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 true like pronunciation has been lost. Um, we can we'll discuss that next week. Okay, the 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 big idea here is that um, the the name is in the angel, and the angel says it, it won't pardon. It will not pardon. So the, this name and the angel has the power to pardon, which is which is something that only God can do. Lastly, so the last form. So we have the pillar and the fire, the angel of the Lord. The name is a, is, is a way by which God reveals himself. We'll discuss the content next week. And then number four, the face. So my face. So just to be clear, so it's not, it's a, it's, it's, it's a word play here. Okay, this is word play, okay? The, the Hebrew word panim, panim, literally can be translated face, or it can also be translated presence, okay? So, so words in our context can be literal or figurative, okay? And so many times a literal word can also be figurative, all right? So it would just depend upon the context. And so this is crazy, but the presence of God, the face of God, right? So if you see the person's face, they're present, right? So if I'm, if I... If, <laughs> If I go in the house and my wife, I see my wife's face, her presence is here, right? <laughs> so it's not literal. No one can see the face of God and live, but it's 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 a it's a anthrop uh, anthropological way to signify the presence of God. Okay, so my presence shall go with me. Um, presence stands for the Hebrew panim, which also proves identification. Um, and so the Isaiah 63 reference before was the presence of God, right? The presence of God was with them. The face of God was with them. Okay. So maybe that's a little trick, tricky, but that's another way that God is revealing himself to them in the, the face, the presence, the name, the angel, and the pillar, the, the pillar of, of a cloud and fire, cloud by day, fire by night. Um, let's, let's, okay. So maybe we kind of rush towards the end. I hope that this is helpful. Um, I hope we're seeing the big picture. That is that Moses is, is the big dog in the old Testament. He is also the redeemer. We'll also talk about him being a, 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 a redeemer. Um, he is the inner, he is the mediator of the old covenant. And then there's these four modes by which God reveals himself to Israel. And you have, he, you now have his abiding presence with his people. Everyone sees that. Whereas with the patriarchs, there is no abiding presence. Now God's presence abides with his people 24-7. But it's not, it's not face to face, right? They can't be in the presence of God. They'll die, okay? It's not in their heart. So we're on the way. We're on the way to what Anthony was talking about. We're on the way to the presence of God. Uh, we're on the way. So, uh, you know, someone says like, man, I wish, I wish I lived in Israel's day because I could see the power of God. No, we don't. We don't wish it because now we have God in our, in our body and we can be assured that we're protected from his judgment because his spirit is in us. So, 
So although you'd want to say that you want to experience the crossing of the Red Sea, I would say that no, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. Okay, let's let's go ahead. Let's let's just have a minute of discussion. Actually, do, do you want to do it's it's nine twelve. Do you want to do a breakout room or no need? What's your vote? You can vote down here. Your reaction. Put a thumbs up if you want to do breakout rooms for just a couple minutes and pray to close out, or we can just close it out here as one group. What's your vote? I want to vote here. I want to see the the, the thumbs. I'm going to start counting them. Be involved. Thumbs up. Thumbs up if you want to go to breakout rooms. No thumbs up. We'll just close it out here. What do you want to do? So Danny's one. K is two. Who else? Thumbs up or just here? I got two so far. Anyone else? Sunny is three. Anyone else? All right. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna break. I'm gonna make. I will send you to breakout rooms if you want to. I'm gonna do a very quick prayer. I'll send you to breakout rooms to discuss if you want. If you just want to leave, you can leave. Okay, so it's really up to you. I'll, I'll make I'll make two breakout rooms here. So let me just hang on here. Okay, let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. And then if you want to leave, you can leave. If you want us to discuss in breakout rooms, you can. It's up to you. Okay, um, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time. And Father God. Um, we recognize that you're a consuming fire and that your presence would destroy us in a second. And um, we, don't, we don't take that for lightly, but at the same time, Father God, we, we, we trust in, in the work of your son that allows us to be in your presence, Father. We thank you for his sacrifice that cleanses us from every sin and, and purifies our hearts, purifies our minds so that we can be in your presence. Father God, may we never take that for lightly. And we're so thankful that we are no longer in this era uh, that the Israelites were, that, that, that your spirit is in us. Your spirit is guiding us. Your spirit is guiding our church. Father God, we no longer have to worship in one, in one tabernacle, at one place. We can worship in our homes with our family. We can worship in our church. Father God, we thank you for this place in redemption that you have brought us. It's been, it's been by your sovereign work. You've chosen us. You've called us to be a uh, 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 priestly people to proclaim your, your excellencies. Father God, may you give us the strength and the vision to, to proclaim your gospel to those around us. May we faithfully share your word. May you strengthen us. May you grant us perseverance. And Father God, I want to lift up in a very special way uh, Pastor Henry, who is going to be going under the knife, Father, may he feel your presence, Father. May, may he feel your presence this week. May, may his family and my young uh, feel your presence. And may you give the surgeons guidance and wisdom that it would be a 100% successful surgery and uh, that you would just be with him in a special way as he, as he, as he goes through this trial. Father God, we also pray for E.G. and Manila and their family. Kay is extended family as they have to make decisions. Father, may this, may you stop the work of, of this virus. May, may he have a full recovery, protect those in the, in the house that, that could also be affected. And so we ask for your blessing to be with us. May your spirit guide us throughout this week. And Father God, we're so thankful that we no longer have angels to guide us, that we have your, your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Last big thing I forgot to say to you, okay? I used to ask God to send his angel before us to prepare our way. No need because we have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so think about that. The angel was anticipatory. Now, I don't want to minimize because God still uses his angels to protect. But what I'm trying to get at is that we now have the, the, the spirit of God with us, guiding us. We don't need the angel. We don't need the angel to prepare the way. <laughs> Because we have a spirit. Anyway, that was just that was just something that was was something uh, transformational for me in my thinking. Like I don't need to pray for the angel to go before because Jesus is the King of the Universe now, and His Spirit is in me and leading me. So that was just a thought. Okay, I'm gonna split you up.